Hello, this is a presentation of a paper modeling speech recognition and synthesis simultaneously, encoding and decoding lexical and sublexical semantic information into speech with no direct access to speech data by Gashper Bigush and Alan Joe. So most existing models um, in speech technology focus either on synthesis or on recognition. In this paper, we wanna test learning of semantically meaningful units in language when the production aspect or synthesis and the perception aspect or recognition are modeled simultaneously. In fact, we'll see in our models, the two components need to interact for learning to happen. So we're proposing several new challenges to the unsupervised speech processing paradigm. First, we operate with a network that learns unique representation for lexical items with no direct access to training data. So the networks actually never sees the training data. In fact, it's twice removed from the training data, as we'll see. Also, we operate with extremely high, high density vector representation in, in the acoustic word embedding paradigm. So why is this important? Reduced representations are more interpretable, um, which basically allows us to find the causal effect between in individual latent variables, um, so la variables in latent space, and linguistically meaningful units, both in production and perception. And basically, we're um, testing the limits of unsupervised representation learning by removing training data from the classifier or from the generator um, or the, the synthesizer. Also, we know that humans acquire speech by both perceiving it and also producing it. In fact, the production and perception mutually influence each other. And if we're modeling the two separately, we're, we're actually missing an important um, part of human speech acquisition or human speech learning, which is the mutual influ influence between production and perception. So in sum, we're modeling production or synthesis and perception recognition simultaneously. And hopefully this will help us build more dynamic and adaptive system of human speech communication that are closer to reality than current models, which treat the two, the two components separately. Okay, so let's take a closer look at how this architecture works. So we have uh, three deep convolutional networks. One is the generator that takes uniformly distributed latent space Z, but it also takes um, either one hot encoding latent codes or binary code latent codes. Um, we have the discriminator that distinguishes between real and generated data. And we have the Q network, which will, can be called also lexical learner, which takes generated data and needs to figure out which unique codes did the generator have when it was producing a particular output. Um, so the training works in the following. The generator needs to encode information. Information here is modeled as a unique code, either binary code or one-hot encoding. And through a series of convolutional layers, transform it into speech data such that the generator will be able to decode that information, right? So we have encoding of information and decoding of information. So the, the Q network takes speech and has to figure out what unique codes, hidden codes did the generator have when it was producing this particular output. And you know, during training, the generator becomes really good at encoding information into speech, and the Q network becomes good at decoding information from speech. And so this is where we model production and per perception simultaneously. So this is a closer look at the generator, right? So latent space, about 100 uniformly distributed, distributed variables and then code variables, a series of convolutional layers that transform the latent space into speech data or waveforms. Okay, so in addition to lexical learning, we're also able to model sublexical learning with this architecture. Uh, so these low dimension vectors that I just talked about enable na ana the analysis of the interaction between individual latent variables. In the CIW GAN architecture, the code vector is just one hot encoded, or encoded, but in the FIW GAN architecture, we actually have binary code encoding. Why is this important? The binary code encoding allows us to basically model holistic lexical learning uh, where each code represents a word or a lexical item, right? But in addition to that, we can model sublexical information which, where each feature can model some sublexical um, information. So each bit can correspond to, say, a presence of a sound or a presence of a engram. So in this paper, we will test whether each unique code corresponds to unique lexical semantics and how individual features in binary code or bits interact or represent sublexical information. 
a presence of a phoneme. Okay, so in this paper, we will focus on the Q network or the classifier, and we will test how it classif how it behaves when it's taken from the architecture and fed unobserved test image data and see what kind of classification do we get, right? If lexical learning happens here. And remember, so the Q network here is twice removed from training, right? So the generator generates data, the Q network classifies it, um, and it never really sees the training data. In fact, it's trained only on the generated data. And the generator itself never sees training data. It's trained on, um, uh, on tricking the discriminator that it's producing real data. So this is fully unsupervised, and we split data into test and training, and we basically test lexical learning on unobserved test data. And not only this is unobserved, the Q network actually never saw any other data except for the generated data um, produced by the generator. OK, so we first try with a small model um, on uh, with eight timid words, ask, ask dark, greasy, oily, rag, gear, wash, and water. We have about 4,000 training tokens and about, about 1,000 test tokens. Um, we send unobserved timid test data through the Q network and see what's happening, how the classification happens. Right. One of the results we get is that the lexical learning happens both in the CIW GAN architecture, where there is one hot encoding, as well as in FIW GAN architecture, where there is binary, hot, uh, binary coding coding. Okay, so each lexical item gets a unique code classification in the Q network. Now, to verify that the generator and the Q network actually share code representations, we can verify lexical learning by generating data with um, the same latent codes as we see in the classification models, right? So we pass these um, this code through the generator while keeping the latent space constant. And we see that in the generator as well, each code representation pretty much corresponds to a lexical item in both the CIW GAN architecture and FIW GAN architecture. OK, so we talked about lexical learning so far, right? So each code gets associated with unique lexical item in both the generator and the Q network or the lexical learner. Now we can test how sublexical information is encoded. We can take a look at a very you know, salient phoneme um, in, the, in the eight words that we tested, namely S, and see how it gets in, encoded. How do we do that? We run the data or we fit the data to a logistic regression linear model where the dependent variable is the presence of S in the input test data and the predictors are the three feature values, OK? So the first two bits appears to have very little effect on the presence of S. But the third bit, or the third feature, has a very strong effect. It appears that the value 0 in the third bit basically denotes presence of S in the lexical item, so sub, some sublexical structure. OK, so how does this scale up to larger um, models? We trained another model on 500, about 500 libid speech words, so much larger model. And we get these very interesting representations where the code most frequency assigned to a word also has the highest count of that same word where compared, compared to all words labeled with that code. So in other words, there is evidence of lexical learner, learning in that larger model as well. For example, 01100111110 is the most common code given to the word well. And well is the most common word that is labeled with this code. OK, so this, uh, this is how the representations look like. The, left gra the graph on the left represents the codes with which the Q network classifies audio files containing word well. On the right graph, you'll see uh, all the words that are classified with this most common code that well was classified with. And there's a match in peaks, OK? This works for well, still, mister, himself, um, and so on. Actually, to test how common these good representations, well-learned representations are, we randomly selected 20 uh, words out of the 508 libre speech words, words, which includes words that actually occur extremely infrequently, right? Of the 20 selected words, four 
of them, or about 20%, have representations where the code most frequently assigned to a word also has the highest count of that same word when compared to all words labeled with that code. In five further cases, two or more peaks have the same, but not higher counts than the code word peak pair, okay? So that's about 45% uh, of successful outcomes if both groups are counted successful. Okay, so just like in the previous smaller model, we can test how sublexical structure is encoded in these networks, right? So we have about 500 words. So we, we use a nine code um, FIW architecture, right? So a nine codes can encode up to two to the power of nine classes. And so we can basically test how the network encodes something like word initial S, okay? So the dependent variable here again is a presence of word initial S in the input test data, or it could be any other sublexical feature we wanna, we're interested in. And the predictors are the nine features, right? The nine bits in the codes. And this is our, the results of the um, logistic regression model, right? So we see that a few features have an extreme, a much stronger effect on the presence of um, word initial S than other features. In fact, if these um, three features are set to value zero, so feature two, three, and five are set to value zero, we have almost 50% of outputs that contain a uh, word initial S. When this, these features are set to one, we have, a, uh, we have very few, almost no, no, no outputs contain word initial S. And now we can find this causal effect between bit structure in the binary code and sublexical structure by verifying these findings in the generator network, right? That's a nice part of, of a modeling production and perception simultaneously. Then we can verify it with the, with the causal effect between latent space structure and the um, some linguistically meaningful units in the output. So now we go back to the generator. We take those three features and we generate the data by manipulating those three features that we figure out um, the note and S in the, in the um, lexical item or word initial S. Right, and so if we if we interpolate in the generator network the feature two, three, and five from zero to one in some interval, for example, in some small interval of point two, we see that the S word initial S gradually disappears from the output. Okay, we can listen to an example. So we see that as we interpolate only three features that we figure out, uh, that we learned that are correspond to word initial S, the S just gradually uh, changes into some other consonants uh, with interpolate, uh, uh, to some other consonant with interpolation. In other words, as we interpolate values of the three features representing S, we observe a causal effect in gener generated outputs as S gradually changes into a different consonant with other major acoustic properties remaining the same in the majority of cases. Okay, so to conclude, a deep neural architecture that simultaneously models the production or synthesis and perception classification learns linguistically meaningful units, lexical items, both lexical items and sublexical properties, from raw acoustic data in a fully unsupervised manner, right? Even when this representation learning is tested at the most, with the most difficult task, right? Never actually observing the data directly, or in other words, being twice removed from training data. So with this model, we can now both generate lexical item in a controlled and predictable manner by manipulating individual variables of the latent space in the generator, and also classify unobserved text lexical item we are with, a, with a unique highly reduced vector representation in the Q network. So highly reduced vector representations enable interpretable semantic exploration of the latent space and exploration of the causal effect between latent space and generated output. And another advantage of modeling lexical learning with this inter information theoretic approach where, in, where lexical items are encoded with um, unique information that it, are represented by binary codes is that we can simultaneously model holistic lexical representation where each code represents a lexical item and sublexical representation learning, right? So where where bits represent or features represent some sublexical units. And we know that humans have to have to learn both, and we do and can learn both. And basically, this is just an, as another step towards 
creating models that are closer to human speech production and perception loop. Thank you for your attention.